Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm very lazy. I just introduced myself with this slide. Of course, with a much older photograph when I looked better and younger. and I got lucky with the hair. It still stayed. Um, two interesting things. One is I've been doing e-health for 20... It's now 24 years. Um, I've seen much less progress than I thought I was ever going to see. And uh, I'm on the engineering side, so... Uh, you know, there's probably at least three kinds of people that get involved in e-health, engineers, medical people, and then people in the sort of management administra administration, government type of uh, part of the sector. So just out of interest, how many people here are medical background people, clinical professionals of some kind? A small minority. <laughs> Most so is everybody else sort of engineering or more like government and some so about half half of government and engineering technical type people it seems like okay that's interesting it's probably the brains trust of Finnish e health to design the future or something like this um, so I'm going to talk about open air o open air is in some sense a technology so it's you know it's the part of an answer to something so I think it makes sense to just look at what is the question and you my view is you have to look at the question you know what are the things we're trying to solve every few years because our understanding of what the problems are change obviously for people in Finland or you know for the country there's some something that's specific to Finland and then there are things probably in common with Nordic countries with similar population and geography and then a lot of things in common with, I would say, Europe and, you know, Western countries in general. Anyway, I'm going to be very, very simple. Uh, so if I was to just characterise the main challenge, you know, what, why would we even bother trying to computerise health in some way? So what's healthcare about? Taking care of patients to identify and resolve problems and achieve goals with respect to those problems. Care is usually supplied by multiple clinics, multiple visits and multiple professionals and it's, that's more the case these days than it ever was. That's increasing. So to complete a care episode requires a process view over time. So in the phrase we use, you assume there's something similar in Finnish, continuity of care, right? It means being able to follow the patient and uh, from the point of when they first present, when they first come in, could be emergency department or whatever else, they say I've got a pain or a problem or they're pregnant, just a normal um, health situation, to the resolution is going to take some sort of journey that involves a person going to different types of clinics, including laboratories, seeing multiple people, typically in these uh, clinics, hospitals, general practice, and in those places we have uh, systems. We have a lot of IT systems here already, um, generally not talking to each other very well. So that's our landscape, and I, all of the countries I've been to, it's it's pretty much the same. I mean, there are some differences, but that's a pretty standard picture. So just for fun, I thought I would make this a little bit concrete with what happened to be a recent health journey of mine. On the 7th of August, I went to the Bilbao Emergency Department with chest pain. It had the right symptoms of angina, and I, I know what angina symptoms are, so I thought, you know, I should do the right thing. I went and got various tests, the typical kind of things that would normally be done in that situation. I went to see my... I, wasn't, I didn't have a heart attack, just... <laughs> I'm still here. I uh, went to see my GP a week later in the UK, where I live. They gave me a little bit of medication, did some typical blood tests, and then referred me to a cardiologist. That referral process had two errors. Uh, on the 19th of August, so roughly a week later, less, I had chest pain at <coughs> rest, and I went myself to the emergency department of one of the hospitals near where I live, a big hospital. They did the usual tests. 
That hospital wanted to refer me to its own cardiology department but couldn't because they're not allowed in that hospital. They wrote a letter to my GP re requesting a, a CT coronary um, angiogram, that's the CT scan to look at the, uh, the state of the coronary arteries. I went again on the 25th of August, a week later with the same symptoms and the same tests and, and so on happened. None, none of these times I had a heart attack. As you can see, I'm still standing here. Uh, on the 30th, I saw a cardiologist. I got an order for a CT scan at a different hospital and uh, that order was for some weeks away. If I had, in fact, did have a serious heart problem, the time that I would have had to wait would have been problematic. Uh, there was an appointment with radiology uh, on the 25th, so that was the appointment, 25th of September. There was an, one error in the appointment, so the appointment wasn't done properly. On the 17th of September, I went myself to a different hospital. Same thing, but those doctors said, you know what, if you stay overnight, we can refer you internally and you can get your CT scan and we can see if you've got a heart problem. So the doctors in Bilbao said, you need that kind of scan. It's very obvious. We've done, we, they did everything else that you can possibly do. So in this overall little journey, I did actually get one of those scans with those CT machine. Uh, I got a, a, positive, a good result. And somewhere in a place that I cannot access is a picture like that that's got some healthy primary arteries. It doesn't mean I'm safe. It just means that, that the blockage problem is not, is not the problem I have. So let's just have a look at, well, oh. so I went to three different hospitals, one GP and uh, one radiology unit and one cardiologist. This is my health record. As you can see, they're printouts from different places. And I can tell you that the doctors love me when I turn up with that pile of paper. That's the only health record they've got to look at um, across those different uh, entities. So that's my little scorecard for just that little bit of healthcare. Now, because I've been working in health informatics a long time, I interrogated all those doctors and they were quite happy to have somebody to talk to. You know, it was a bit like I'm the psychologist here because I understand your pain and terrible IT systems. But look at this, six week delay, um, that's partly just to do with the availability of um, you know, staff and equipment, so that's like a structural thing. <laughs> Referral errors, two out of two. Ordering errors, two out of five. Electronic health data sharing between institutions, nothing. Now I'm still in the diagnosis phase, there could be more things that I have to do. All of the doctors that I interviewed told me that this was absolutely normal. Now, of course, operating in the network of people I know in uh, healthcare and health informatics, everybody says the same thing. So this is the scorecard for the UK in uh, 2018. There's almost no health data sharing. There's continual errors in system-to-system -system messaging, even inside hospitals. Referrals are routinely wrong. If you know how to deal with a system like people like me or doctors or whatever, probably we all do, you know, we can make the right phone calls and fix things and actually we end up getting in our appointments a little bit earlier than other people. But more people don't know how to do this. Uh, there are errors in orders. I experienced some of these. So in the UK, the history of spending was 10.7 billion uh, between 2002 and 2013 on the national program for IT. The summary health record, uh, which is not really used by anybody much, is already a legacy. Um, the technology is CDA, HL7 version 3 messages. Um, the technology is not, I mean, that's partly an issue, but there are other reasons why it's um, a problem uh, and that's what we're going to go into here. I know you have a CDA system here, a, a, a national one here, so we can talk about that later. That was actually one of the um, smart things that Finland did. Um, and it's, I can, the interesting thing is it's way more operational and successful than our much, much more expensive system. Anyway, so how we're doing in 2018 uh, in the UK and in a lot of other countries I work in, including the US uh, and Brazil and some other European countries, is the interoperability between 
facilities is bad. The interoperability between the systems and the facilities is bad. I mean, there's something there, but it's not very good. Uh, the representation of process as a coherent concept is almost non-existent. Of course, there are bookings and, and systems, and but these are all scattered pieces. You can't pull up on a screen a picture of what is going on with a patient in terms of that process. So let's just look at this whole thing from the point of view of how doctors look at it. And I'm just going to do it from the point of view of guidelines. Now, everybody here knows what guidelines are. Um, there are more and more published guidelines for different health situations. These are just lists of guidelines. So you can see um, assessing and diagnosing sus suspected stable angina. And then there's a list of guidelines there. And there's some more guidelines here about managing stable angina. These guidelines are from NICE, which is the National Institute of, Care of Health and Care Excellence in the UK. It's a very, very good site. It's worth having a look at. Um, in Finland, you would have the same thing of some sort, or it could be based around a research institution, um, uh, like, the, like Karolinska, that kind of institution in Sweden. So I don't know exactly how it's organized here, but I know for certain that doctors here would be using similar kinds of things. Um, there's some more. Uh, accessing, uh, assessing and diagnosing suspected stable angina. You have these kind of logical decision trees. Um, you can see in the middle there, assess the typicality of the chest pain as a typical or atypical or even non-angina. So there are things in guidelines, you can think of them as decision pathways that could potentially be computerized. If you look at a particular guideline, chest pain of recent onset, assessment and diagnosis, and you can see it starts to get a little bit complicated. Now, a cardiologist, or even just a normal doctor with you know, some good knowledge of cardiology, they know all of this pr pretty much. Except you can see that there are, there's another 20 pages of this. Um, I think I counted about 200 steps. They don't know every single thing because you can see there are dates after some of these rows like 2010 and 2016. That's because evidence is changing and the guidelines change. Now the understanding as the doctors and probably a lot of you know, as, just to give you a very simple example, who, you know, who, who thinks that LDL, low density lipoprotein, is the main thing you should find out if you're trying to find out about your heart health? Well, 15 years ago, everybody thought that. Today, there are still general practitioners, and probably not in hospitals, but still general practitioners talking like that. A lot of people have realised that they should be looking at the HDL-LDL ratio, and sometimes if you go to your doctor, they'll be, that's what they'll be telling you, you know, you've got to make this comparison. And a lot of labs will now pre-compute that. Actually, the current um, evidence, uh, not from yesterday, but from some years ago, is that the triglycerides to LDL is the one to be looking at. So these changes are done by large cohort studies and you know, this new evidence is accumulating all the time. In, in heart health, I've been reading a book and a, it's amazing to discover it's all going to be turned on its head by uh, genetics. So my point about all of this is just to show you what are the, what's the structure of health and health information at various levels. We have guidelines, which is evidence-based um, uh, clinical process, models of clinical process. That turns into a planning level at which there can be multiple steps. So one part of a guideline where it says obtain a, uh, a CTCA, that's the coronary artery CT scan, logistically can turn into some appointments and a, a wait of two weeks and going to a radiologist and, and whatever else. So if you're going to manage that over the time and not lose the patient, we have to think, OK, there's a planning level we have to worry about. Clinical people ideally want, I remember people telling me this in Sweden and the UK and everywhere more than 10 or 15 years ago, we work from guidelines or at least medical, standard medical practice. Uh, what they're wanting now is a co-pilot because those guidelines with 200 steps that keep changing, you need to be able have a way of tracking it. They want a picture of the process of each patient, the, the care process, where are we at? Have they had the referral, have they had the scan, etc. cetera? Um, who's taking care of the patient? Is there something I have to look at? 
etc. They want, of course, to look at all of the orders and the status of interventions, all of the exams, notes, and, and so on. So what we think of the standard EHR today, that's like the data, that's just one, one thing out of all of these, uh, this picture. So the big picture is we actually have three levels. We've got models of practice, we've got planning view, in other words, the clinical process view, and we've got the information level, which we could think of as the traditional EHR. Now, today what we have is a lot of data inside systems, that's for sure, but most of it's proprietary, fragmented, and generally not very shareable. We, we also have some fragments that represent the process of what's going on with the patient. What we really want is something like this. My EHR, references to the relevant guidelines, my plans, there could be more than one, my information across all of those institutions that those departmental systems can talk to. Now, I'm not telling you anything different than what I would have told you 10 years or probably even 20 years ago with maybe a different diagram. I'm sure you all know this. I'm sure I haven't told you anything new yet. Does anybody find this particularly contentious? Nobody's running out to strangle me yet, so I don't think it's very contentious. Also, we'd like the patient to be able to talk to their own record. I think you can do that here in Sweden. We can't do that uh, routinely, I'm oh, Sweden, in Finland. Uh, I, I think uh, we can't do that connection in, uh, in the UK at the moment. After all that money that was spent, there's nowhere that I can log on to look at my health record. That's why I carry that paper out. So I'm one of the so-called e-health experts of the whole country in the UK, and I, that, that's how I know to carry paper, because I know what the state of the systems is. Now, that's a kind of deep irony, isn't it? OK, so the future. Of course, there's a political economic dimension. We probably won't get into that, and I don't understand the political and you know, economic side very well here in Finland anyway. Let's just talk about the technical and socio-technical level. So technically speaking, we need an open platform, and I've put the word designed there as well. What I'm flagging there is the usual idea is, OK, um, health authorities and ministries of health, and most people realise what I've just said is approximately true. They might have a different version. And they think, right, we have to get standards, because obviously we need to standardise data. That's a good idea. One of the mistakes, and we've learned this, uh, again, UK, I've seen it in the US uh, and other countries, all we have to do is get the right standards together and tell the industry, use those standards, and it's, it's all going to work like magic. It turns out that the cost of using standards on a per standard basis and the cost of integrating the standards together and making them fit for purpose for your country and for whatever situations and requirements are in your country are, f are vastly greater than what people think. And people, standards organisations, they do a bit of marketing and they like to say, oh, this is going to solve everything. So we, there's a big gap between what is really needed. What is obviously going to work is a platform that functions coherently uh, in terms of data sharing, data computation to allow analytics, the process view, all those things I just mentioned, computable representation of guidelines. If you took that as an engineering problem, some big companies would get together and they put engineers and they would design something. So now you have to think, okay, if we're the government and, and like a, a public sector inquiry, are we going to just grab some standards like you could grab, the, if you grab standards for cars, like standards for the tyre, standards for the windows, standards for the, the, uh, the petrol, you know, um, chemical composition, and give it to people and say, right, make cars, and actually make a transport network. You can see there's a big gap there. We need a semantic architecture. So the semantics are what I briefly mentioned, and I'll go into a little bit further, semantics of health. It needs to be semantically flexible and scalable. So I'm talking about health information at the level of the domain when I talk about semantics. You can think blood pressures or encounter notes 
or diagnoses or care plans. That these are all somatic entities. Uh, it needs to be flexible and scalable because what is today's idea, for example, in those guidelines or treatment plans, is, is going to change tomorrow. Uh, even simple things change. Um, so our models of health information and process need to keep changing over time. It needs to be model-based so that you can separate models of semantics from specific technologies. Ten years ago, everybody loved SOAP XML. Now, if you talk to any young programmer, they hate it. Um, so do big data processing experts because it's terribly inefficient. Uh, young people now don't like XML, they like JSON. In five years' time, it'll be something else. IT, concrete technology, goes, it's a fashion kind of exercise. Um, operating systems change all the time, databases change all the time. Now we have a world full of these no SQL databases. We have to separate the semantics from the concrete technology. We need terminology. We need tool-driven development so that these things can be used to help engineers build systems because they're not all going to go and get a PhD in e-health or health informatics or you know, some complicated discipline. They're going to want to build applications quickly on a platform and deploy them quickly and cost-effectively. So semantically, that's just a slightly different rendering of what I already mentioned in the big picture. At the top level, we have have a power cut. I don't know what happened there. Something's, I've got that on that screen and that's gone back to there. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can. Okay, let's see. So we were here. Working again. There you go. Right, so models of care, process level representations of care of particular patients, so I'm talking at the logistical level of referrals and discharges and care plans, um, and then healthcare information. So guidelines process data, that's a way of remembering it. At a technical level, uh, version, we want a services ecosystem, separated services. Don't worry about the specifics here, but you can see up the left hand side I've got HCF, that means healthcare facility, like a, a hospital or a GP surgery or some particular clinic. There are some services that would probably be deployed in IT there. I mean, it could be in the cloud, but you understand I'm talking about focal, uh, focusing on that level of institution. It doesn't mean it's physically on a disk drive and a computer system anymore because that's changing quite a lot. The second level is regional systems um, and the way this particular picture happens to be drawn is that patient level services like the EHR and so on are in a regional level. Now I mean that line could come down and the reality today was that most patient records are inside EMR systems inside a GP or a hospital location. I'm not saying this is the answer, I'm just saying you need an answer that is a services ecosystem picture and at the bottom level you would have some national level services. So you could, you know, you guys are all experts, you could potentially draw a picture that you thought was what Finland needs that is in this dimension. You also need services that address things like knowledge and terminology and so on. So. Again, I don't think any of the engineers here would dispute the general thing I'm saying. You might dispute the particular arrangement and naming of services, but that's just one picture. Now, in that, various types of standards could be implicated. You know, these are some of the big ones you know about fire. I'm here to talk about open air. IHE, I'm sure everybody has heard of. Loink, um, SNOMED. There's all WHO uh, terminology standards and so on. I didn't even try to put all the possible standards that might be on there. So I'm just trying to build a picture of what uh, is the big picture in which open air provides some utility. So in a very, very simple way, the open air paradigm is uh, services, standardised data, 
uh, controlled by models and I've drawn it in a very simple way. Of course we always have these existing systems on the side. Now I've drawn them as if they're you know, little systems, usually they're big systems and the open air system, if there was an open air system it would be the little system. So I'm just drawing it in that way to draw attention to what I'm talking about, right? Not to say that an open air system is the big system. Uh, standardised data, APIs, standard APIs and the basic message here is we build applications which can get data out of a health, re health record and put, rec put data into a health record. Open Air is about, it's an architecture for a standardised health record uh, for patient information and process information. That's why the arrows have a double headed. You'll see why that matters later on. So there are various levels of models which you might have heard of. At the bottom, reference model and task planning, I'll explain that a bit later. Archetypes is a domain level of model. Templates is another level of model. Uh, and these are the models which define data and information inside open air systems. Why are there three levels of modeling? Okay, well, you need a logical model of data. That's the reference model. That's the guy at the bottom, the blue cube. At the clinical level, we have discovered over the last probably 15 years that the most likely estimate for the number of clinical data points needed is something like 30,000. That would be my low estimate. It's not my estimate. It could be 50,000. It could be more. And I'm, that doesn't include genomics and proteomic um, data, which would vastly multiply that. Now, if somebody told you that you even had to model 10,000 data points, would you instantly think of going, right, I'll get my UML tool and start building a UML model? Just think about that. Am I going to really make, I don't know, 2,000 classes with five uh, data points each? But then they come along and say, oh, actually, it's 20,000 data points. And I'm, am I going to build a giant single level UML model and then go and build, what, Java software and implement that? I'm hoping that all the engineers can guess that that's not going to be even vaguely sustainable. Um, so we do something called archetypes, which is a type of model which enables these very large numbers of data points to be modelled that isn't software. The third level is to enable those data points to be put together into data sets. So an example of a data point is systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, fetal heart rate during a pregnant woman's examination, and so on. Another 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 of those. Now, I only want one definition of what systolic arterial blood pressure is, but there's going to be a lot of forms and messages and documents that have some blood pressure in here and the other one has it here and, and so on, right? I think that's pretty obvious. So we need to have a way of defining what that structure is. Now, here in Finland, because you have this national CDA system, you might be used to thinking of documents. So that level there is the equivalent of the document of a particular kind of document. You can imagine a discharge summary that has a data point like key diagnosis or HbA1c. But you can easily imagine another document, there probably is one in the Finnish system, that has you know, a, a diagnosis or HbA1c or some other datum that is also in a, in a different type of document and so on. So we need to be able to define those, uh, those data sets. So I'm just going to very quickly show the, those three levels of model. So the reference model, so that's the blue guy down at the bottom, this is the one that defines the logical model of open air data. It's actually not very complicated. Most of the clinical data is in something we call composition. When something happens, like a patient goes to see a doctor or is seen by a doctor in the hospital or a, a lab um, test is performed, data can be committed to the health record in what we call a composition. So this whole thing, this is a health record of one person. There's something called a directory which just enables you to arrange and um, uh, essentially tag compositions, for example, into episodes. 
there's a status object that tells you the status of the record. It could be active or inactive. There's, you have to be able to do some technical things with health records. There's an access control um, element. You'll see that all of this has been drawn with multiple layers. These represent versions. The whole thing is version controlled. Um, as it happens, I was involved in building systems like, uh, you probably all know what Git and SVN are, these kind of version control systems. Um, I was doing that in, in 1996, and I knew that we needed this in the health record, so it, I made sure it was in the architecture starting from the year 2000. And now the world caught up with us, and everybody wishes they had a health record architecture like this. Now, that's a vastly simplified picture. There's actually a whole bunch of specifications containing the reference model definition. Um, you can find those on the website easily enough. Just to summarize the key elements of the reference model, it incorporates 20 years of research. Most of it was worked out by doing research in universities and industrial research environments around the world. It wasn't done in standards uh, meetings. It has about 150 classes, so it's not big. It's very, very stable. We know that. I mean, we, th we designed it to be that way, and it has turned out to be that way pretty successfully over the last 10 years. All open-air clinical data in the world are logical instances of that one reference model, from Russia to Australia to Korea to Japan to UK. So it provides the basic data interoperability between uh, open air systems. It supports marking by archetypes, and I'll explain what that means. It enables open air repositories to be built and deployed without prior development of clinical data definitions. You don't need to know what does a blood pressure recording look like. You can deploy, you can you can uh, engage a system supplier to give you an open air system. You can pay them five million euros and have it deployed. And it might be a month later before you work out what the models of clinical data are, or even a year later. You can plug them in at that time. They're just going to work. That's how the system works. Because the archetype level isn't part of the software. So this is just a, I mean, for people who like UML diagrams, there's many, many more complicated UML diagrams than this. It just basically says that the EHR consists of those, you can notice those things I mentioned, those four things. The composition is the main one. Inside compositions are something called entries. That's the main clinical data. Uh, the key types of clinical data are observation, evaluation, instruction, action, and administrative. So these correspond in some way to the basic sort of phases of clinical investigation uh, of a patient in a, in a clinical sense. You know, you, you make observations. Evaluations include things like diagnoses. Uh, instructions are things like orders. Actions are a record of what was done in response to an order. For example, drug administrations. Could be inpatient, could be outpatient, it doesn't matter. It's the same basic model for all of them. Below that level, there are some more complicated data structures, including a time-based um, structure that enables uh, device data and other time series data to be recorded. There's some other technical stuff. Eventually, you have something called cluster and element, and eventually you get to data value. And then you have different types of data, um, textual, including coded text, so codes like SNOMED codes, that kind of thing, quantitative, date time data, URIs, time specification, so that means time in the future, like three times a day, that sort of thing. Encapsulated is a type of data like uh, multimedia data. So these are just different data types. So you can tell by that it's not a terribly complicated model. Now the full UML diagrams obviously look a bit more complicated than that, but not, not vastly, that's basically it. So let's get onto archetypes. Archetypes are used to model data at the domain level. Lab results, blood pressure or vital signs, diagnosis, pregnancy notes, anything you can think of. Anything that's recorded in the sense that a clinical person would record it, that's what archetypes are used to model. There are about 700 publicly available archetypes um, 
in national systems or something like a national system. Those archetypes represent about 10,000 reusable data points and groups. So you remember before I said 30,000 to 50,000, so my guess is we've got about a third or less of the total data points that is needed to cover all of health. But there's a pretty good coverage. I mean, you can imagine that we didn't just cover kind of this 30% here and this nothing over here. There's a kind of partial coverage of a lot of disease areas. There are about 2,000 people involved in doing that modelling on the Open Air Clinical Knowledge Manager. Archetypes expressed in archetype definition language, so it's a language, a formal language, it's an ISO standard. Uh, it's actually used in HL7 in one of the groups called SIMI. It's multilingual, including all glyph-based languages. That's not you guys, but it is some open air users in the world. Um, archetypes are usually published as standard models. The idea is to make them public and reusable. Uh, for example, the UK has a national registry of archetypes. Norway has one as well. There's a number of editing tools, and the, it's growing, the tool situation. So roughly how they work. I could send three hours, or this is my attempt to compress it into one sentence. They define particular valid arrangements of reference model building blocks, so that's the primitives from the reference model, that represent particular domain level information items. So think about it like the instructions that come with Lego. If I get a box of Lego, you, you've probably got Lego in a lot of homes here, like I have when I was a kid, we all presumably had. So the Lego bricks is like the bricks of the reference model. Let's say that there's 50 different types of brick. Now you can get a piece of paper that comes with those different boxes, and one box has got, you know, how to make a plane. And it's, you're going to make a Fokker or you know, some sort of plane, and you're going to put the bricks together in a certain way. Ah, I have a plane. Now, to Lego plane, it's all kind of you know, square, like 1980s pixelated, but that's Lego, so that's nice. You get another design, and you make a, a house. And another one, you make a dog. But it's all out of those same bricks. I didn't have some other bricks to make the dog. Now, I know today everybody's got those modern Lego bricks and they've got all you know, the smooth, shiny surfaces, but if you remember back to the Lego that we had when we were all young, it was just those more basic bricks, right? But you can still build things out of them. So that's the, that's the basic concept. An archetype model is a model saying how to put bricks of the reference model together to represent different things, OK? So inside the CKM, that's the Clinical Knowledge Manager, that's the address in open air. That's part of the list of those about 650 archetypes, I think. Um, there's one archetype. It's rendered as a mind map, adverse reaction risk. So clinical people look at these models and they see, oh, OK, adverse reaction risk, data, substance, status, criticality. And you can see these little markers that tell you the data type, like a T is a text. Uh, that three-way thing is a decision of some kind. Uh, no, I think it's, a, it's the equivalent of a checkbox or a choice. Uh, that little calendar thing, onset of last reaction is a date time. So you, they look at this and, and they build these models. And they think, right, let's talk. You know, they can understand this. They don't have to look at UML or any sort of technical stuff. Just to show that these things can be quite big. You see that node there, reaction event? Let's blow that up. It's got a lot of details in there. These archetypes can be quite big. You see those data types, they're coming from the reference model. Um, the allowed structures of the archetype also comes from the reference model. So just to convince you, that's a more, much more technical view and a different tool that shows, um, I didn't have a point to do it, but anyway, you can see systolic, diastolic, mean arterial pressure, so these are blood pressure, you can recognise this as blood pressure. These other nodes up here allow you to have a time <coughs> of series of blood pressures, it's very, very common in uh, device data or hospital situation. You've got some state down here, but you've got a lot of codes and stuff in here as well. And the most technical, that's the raw ADL language. It, it connects codes in green to blue um, class and attribute names from the reference model. 
don't worry about the details. Some of you might have studied this. The rest is just you don't know what you're looking at. But I'm just showing you that there is a very, very technical and bulletproof uh, language. Now, I say bulletproof in the sense that it's been around since uh, before about 1999 and had two major versions and 15 years plus of tool building. So we didn't, this isn't from last week. This has been an ISO standard twice, 2008 and this year or next year, depending on when they finalise the next round of standardisation in ISO. So that's archetypes. Numbers of archetypes in CKM, ah, it's 734, of which I think 546 are treated as active. You can see that they're in different level, different uh, publication status. So it, there's a whole workflow of publication and, and governance. There's, that's the number of users each month, so it's over 2,000 at the moment. Now, there's not 2,000 you know, active authors. My guess is there's a few hundred. Uh, and then a few hundred, or the rest of reviewers, and they see something in the news feed that says, talks about you know, diabetes or skin or something, and, and they're, they're a specialist of that kind. So they say, ah, oh, I've got to fix that, you know, because no specialist wants to let some wrong model go into production when they know that specialty. And it works pretty well. It's, it's a good system. Um, those 2,000 people, all different types of professions, the 40% is health informatician. Most of the rest <clears throat> are some sort of medical or allied care or nursing. That's the Norwegian uh, CKM. So you can see, first of all, that it's in Norwegian language. Um, it brings in a mixture of archetypes from the open air central CKM, clinical knowledge manager, and Norwegian ones. They have two jobs. One is to translate to Norwegian, obviously. <laughs> The second one is to review and add or adjust archetypes, which you do by specialisation, a bit like in normal software engineering, uh, to if there are some extra data points that need to be added for Norway. Everybody's got their own data points. You have to be able to localise, and also they build templates. I didn't, I should have clicked on the template. That's the second tab over there, the little orange tab. There are some Norwegian templates, but you can go to that uh, you see the URL, archetypa.no slash ckm. It's open. You can just go and look. I, I probably should say that how they're doing it, I mean, the human level of governance, I would recommend is something for Finland to have a look at. I mean, I know that you're aware of this. It's not like you didn't hear of this. But uh, certainly, you know, there are similarities for obvious reasons between Norway and Finland in terms of country size and size of, you know, the health system that the ministry has to work with and the size of the sector, the IT sector and so on. So there are certainly similarities and you know, general socioeconomic types of problems and so on. So they've established a very good working model of governance in Norway, uh, which, to be honest, probably should be adopted in the UK and some other countries as well. Led by Helsi Bergen, so that's, uh, oh, Helsi Vest, which is Bergen part of, on the west uh, coast. Okay, I did reference model, I did archetypes. A template, you remember I said, is a kind of a data set that can take pieces of archetypes and arrange them in a group that you could think of as a document or a message or some, it could be what's on a form. You know, there are different data items. So it's used to model different things. Forms, messages, documents. They could be standardised as well. I think Norway probably has or is going to standardise a template for discharge summary that can be used for the whole of Norway. Templates have two software engineering functions. They're used to generate design time artefacts like XML schemas and forms, things that software people want. You remember back at the beginning I said we need a tool generating uh, ability or tool based ability so that artefacts that software people want to use are generated out of the models so that they can quickly build components and applications. Oh, sorry. The last one is the templates are the artifacts that are injected into the runtime EHR systems. That's how a system knows about archetypes. It actually has templates and the archetypes in a special repository. 
So there's a picture of a template being edited in a new tool from Mirand, uh, which is a Slovenian company which is doing a lot in open air. This is called ADL Designer. It's a very nice web tool. And you can see just a very basic functionality. There are some data points being removed from an archetype blood pressure. You can see a second archetype, Braden scale, the one just above it with the I symbol. So there's two archetypes there. There are some data points removed. You undergo this process. You can rename things. There's all sorts of tricks you can do. And you can build your data set from those archetype elements. That's what a template enables you to do. How do you get data out of a system? Ah, everything we just talked about is kind of oriented towards getting data into the system and representing it. Well, obviously, there's going to be an API situation. We're going to you know, get data out initially by calls through APIs. Um, OpenAir has a REST API published. There's something called archetype query language. It's based on archetypes and reference model. It doesn't know anything about physical DB schemas. And that makes archetype AQL queries portable across OpenAir vendor systems. So the APIs, there's a model of services. You can see the key one, uh, where are we? EHR service on the, on the left, bottom left, the blue one, that's the main EHR. Uh, demographics, uh, sorry, demographics also in blue. System log. We haven't specified all of these, we've specified some of them. <coughs> Oops, sorry. That's one of the APIs, that's a, a um, apiary, it's like Swagger, so again for the software people you'll recognise these kind of tools that enable you to document APIs and publish them. Here is an AQL query. Some of you would have seen it. For everybody else, it's just going to look like Chinese, or the way Finnish looks to me. <laughs> but the interesting thing is, OK, look at all the blue bits, like EHR, composition, observation. Those are the names of classes from the reference model. The green parts are the names of archetypes. There's two in the middle, or paths from archetypes. Now, this is just the raw version of the query you can't see, but you can guess from this part down the bottom, you see it's got a select from where structure. So this part down the bottom is the where clause. It just says where this path magnitude is bigger than 140 and this path magnitude is bigger than 90. You can instantly guess it's systolic and diastolic blood pressure. This is the blood pressure archetype. <coughs> Those paths are relative to the blood pressure archetype. Now there's nothing in here, anywhere in this query, that mentions a database table of any kind, neither non-SQL or SQL or any other sort of uh, database concrete artifact. These queries are interpreted by uh, product-specific interpreters that convert them to the type of query that gets used in an actual system. And it turns out, because everything is path-based and most vendors have some uh, nice arrangement of data that understands path the utilisation of paths to identify data points, this actually isn't a very hard interpreter to write. And there are a number of vendors who wrote that interpreter and it works very nicely. Right, how am I doing for time? Because I'm not, I don't have a... Maybe over 10 minutes. 10 minutes, right. So I'm going to be pretty quick. I'm just going to give you a little bit of um, an overview going back to this process level question. So the reference model does have two types, instruction and action, which are to do with process in the sense of an instruction is usually used to represent an order. So an order is some sort of process concept, right? It's a request to another entity to do something like uh, provide drugs or uh, to do surgery or, or some sort of intervention. Actions record <coughs> uh, things that were done in response to orders. So that's already some kind of process view but we need a lot more, as I indicated earlier on. So we've got a new specification in open air called task planning. It's based on quite a lot of work, two years of analysis and workshops with various uh, companies, including Tieto here in Finland. Um, another project that I worked on for three years at Intermountain Healthcare, quite a, a big literature review an analysis of existing workflow standards, including these ones that you see on the screen. So 
we did some serious work on this and it's why we're only doing it now because it's taken a long time and uh, it's a difficult area getting this process stuff right. Very, very quickly, a way to understand what the specification is doing, <coughs> it provides a way to express a, what we call a work plan definition. For example, a definition of steps to uh, perform chemotherapy, one uh, iteration of chemotherapy for a, let's say, a breast cancer patient, right? So there's a number of days in most modern chemotherapy regimes. This definition would be worked on and modelled. Um, it could be specialised from archetypes that is a general chemotherapy multi-drug archetype. Uh, anyway, let's assume that, it, that there is an archetype for a work plan definition for a particular kind of chemotherapy, let's say five drugs, five days, and it could be executed inside a single enterprise like a hospital or an outpatient clinic that does chemotherapy. And in that environment there's an IT environment and there'll be a work plan engine that executes the work plan definition and that acts, that engine talks to the actual carers in the, in the human work environment and they see things on the screen. So it's helping them, reminding them to do things, you know, don't, don't forget you've got a, a certain drug, it's day two, it has to be a 24 hour syringe driver infusion and uh, it's, it's ready now. And you, you can see the plan ahead of time of what is to be done. So the execution of the work plan is to do that kind of thing. A more complicated work plan might have more steps that actually carry across multiple um, carers in different enterprises. And so we have to think about problems of <clears throat> you know, how to execute a work plan or parts of a work plan in different places because there might not be a single IT environment. There isn't today, almost never, for all of these different um, physical healthcare facilities. But we are working on that we're, these, these are the assumptions that we're making that we have to solve these kind of problems. So there's a design level and the way it's done is designing um, archetypes based on, uh, there's, there's a, a task planning reference model. So there's another reference model like that UML model is about 90 classes but it's got a lot of other primitives to do with process like task and task group and these kinds of things. You build archetypes of those, that reference model, and they, they are models of plans, specific types of plans. They are instantiated into a uh, clinical planning application uh, so that clinical workers can see the plan, and they might want to adjust the plan before it's activated. For example, they might just want to set the dosages because chemotherapy is dosage is always based on weight and body surface area and it's, it's a pers person level thing. So they might make adjustments with an application to do that. <coughs> Those plans, uh, currently they go into the health record and they might be committed a number of times as they're worked on by the, in the planning phase. A little bit later they'll be materialised into a task planning engine and uh, then they can be actually executed and what happens in that environment is that the task planning engine talks to runtime applications that the performers have access to and as they do their work and sign off the tasks, normal open air data is created, those observation and action, and that is committed into the health record. So roughly that's the, that's the overall workflow of task planning. Now if I try to go, I mean even that looks complicated, I realise. The models underneath would take a lot longer for me to explain than we have time here, but um, it's, uh, I mean, there's a, it's quite a lengthy uh, specification, but it, it's online, it's publicly available. Um, it's got a lot of explanation that hopefully helps people to understand, you know, not just UML diagrams, but the design logic behind it. A few quick comments on open air and fire, because I know that's a burning question. Haha, -ha, did you hear the joke I just made? So that's a picture of open air, that's the paradigm. We're adding some kind of systems into an environment and it's model driven. That's the simplest way I'm going to put it. 
FIRES paradigm is it has some models called, that's resources, they call them resources. They have something called profiles and extensions in that, that's the next blue box. And the design is to build APIs, and they've got some nice tricks for building APIs. They've kind of almost redefined, or you know, they've added something for sure to you know, how to do REST APIs, certainly in health, but possibly elsewhere as well. Anyway, the idea is that you're, you do all this work to build APIs that will suck information out of these legacy systems, as in existing systems, I don't mean it in a pejorative way, uh, and give them to applications. And you can, probably I should have drawn on you know, some arrows going from more than one system, but just going to one application. So it's allowing you to kind of consolidate stuff and look at it on the screen. So that's giving you some value for sure. Uh, now, there are some things to think about here. Um, it's, it's a retrieval-based design. It's not designed for writing to the EHR. There are people who talk about making EHRs out of FHIR. There's a whole discussion that we can have there. Um, FHIR imposes its own set of models for data extraction. Now, that's a good thing in the sense that there are models, so we can talk about models separate from just um, REST. Uh, they're not connected to existing models of OpenAir or HL7 SIMI and, or Veterans Health Administration Federal Health Information Model or a lot of other models. So we've got competing models now. So that's that's a problem. If content is provided, is de, sorry, if content is defined with private profiles, it won't be interoperable. Now, a number of analysts and fire using organisations have made that statement. That's not particularly. I agree with it. It's technically correct, but I'm not trying to make it as a political statement myself. It's, I've read that on a number of expert blogs and so on. I do know because I worked at Salt Lake City uh, Intermountain Healthcare for three years that uh, Cerner, who was there, has not had an easy time mapping Cerner's data to FHIR. I don't remember whether there is any Cerner systems in Finland, but it, it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm, that's just because Cerner happened to be there. I'm not making a comment about Cerner. I could be talking about Epic, Allscripts, Siemens, any of those big systems, right? Uh, FHIR seems to be it probably it, it undoubtedly will get easier to map complex, realistic data, but it's not that easy at the moment for so, at least some categories of data. There is a fire picture of a blood pressure. You can see it's an observation resource with most things. Oh no, that's they retained, but inherited. The main value is removed, and some components, systolic BP, is put in as an extra component. So you just build a kind of ad hoc tree at the bottom with all the data, at least for observational data. So I think that might be interesting. Uh, very quickly, we're probably out of time, I suspect. Are we at a coffee break or something like that? Yeah, a few minutes because you have the wrong flight. We are all locals. No, well, I, well, I'm flying. to hurry so we can I, have the coffee. A, I'm flying tomorrow and B, it's only to London. So it depends on, that's not a long flight for me. Yeah. That's a short flight. Okay, so I've got a, a few slides just to quickly give you some statistics and picture of <coughs> the worldwide picture of open air, okay? I put Moscow first because it's the biggest, and you know, the Russians have got one thing going for them. It's like, it's not exactly a democracy, and there are, and, but how, how good are our democracies these days? I don't really know, you know? Sometimes it's an advantage to just be able to say, you know what, we're going to do this, and just to say, that's how it is. And I'm kind of being serious there, because they've got this Ministry of Information in Moscow. I mean, we even heard, you're just hearing the words Ministry of Information, that sounds very communist. But they can put a single health record system in for the whole 13 million systems, citizens of Moscow. I don't know of any other country, well, you can go to China, I'm sure they're doing it there, but you know, you don't hear a story like this anywhere in what we think of as democracies. Uh, it includes task planning, so that's um, Mirand, is that Slovenia company, they're one of the main suppliers there. Slovenia national system and also the main medical centre in Ljubljana. Norway, uh, the supplier is called DIPS. I think probably most people here would have heard of DIPS because it's the biggest supplier there of the uh, hospital systems. Netherlands, there's probably a dozen or something like that systems there which are open air. I, I should say uh, Russia has another 50 systems which are open air as well in Chelyabinsk and all kinds of strange places. Australia, which I don't keep track of anymore, even though I'm originally Australian. China, there are at least four big projects uh, which are some sort of commercial, private, public kind of thing. 
I'm only just learning what they are, but these aren't university proof of concept projects. There's something much bigger than that uh, based on the presentations I've seen. There's probably about <coughs> five sites in the UK. Plymouth is the biggest one, Plymouth Hospital Trust. Brazil, it's a complicated story. There's um, big research hospitals uh, are using it in Brazil. Some states are using it. There are, I haven't counted, but I think it's about 12 or 15 vendors. So these are some of the vendors. There's dips from Norway, uh, from a lot of different countries. Uh, you see Tieto is, your, is a Finnish vendor. Right here, some people from Tieto here. <coughs> That vendor list is growing. The community size is about 1,000 members going by the mailing lists. It's probably more than 50 countries. I know it's a lot of countries. I don't really have a good way of analysing that. The, as I said before, there's 2,000 people involved in the clinical modelling, and that actually keeps growing. So that's an interesting thing. You, you might think it, you know, if it went stagnant, that would be a bad sign, but it does keep growing. Um, <coughs> Legally speaking, it's just being converted to a UK-based community interest company to enable it to operate as a sort of European non-profit. It's always been non-profit, of course. It has a board structure which you can find on the website very easily. There's a governance of specifications called the Specification uh, Editorial Committee. Governance of archetypes done by a small number of clinical editors that manages those 2,000 contributors. And there's a bunch of some useful resources, which I just realised you need the electronic form <laughs> to decode the URLs, but anyway. Sorry about the length. I wish I could do that in 30 minutes instead of, did I take one hour? I feel bad about that. It's fine, it's fine. Anyway, I hope it was useful. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Thomas, for the presentation.